I think the way the House advocates of impeachment proceeded uh, was badly wrong. I think it was impeachment malpractice. You could have been that person providing that testimony. And it would not have made any difference. You can certainly understand why your critics say, why didn't he come forward before? Why is he making a profit on this now? You know, it has, it has nothing to do with making a profit. It has everything to do with making sure that the constitutional responsibilities that are accorded the different branches of government are carried out the right way. John Bolton taking heed for waiting until now to talk about impeachment when many say he could have helped Democrats make their case if he had just spoken out sooner. Top Democrats, they're livid, and even Jerry Nadler, head of the House Judiciary Committee, said it's just not worth dragging Bolton before Congress at this point. But it is a different story for William Barr. That is Nadler's own panel will grill the Attorney General next month about all of the controversies he's in the middle of, including the clearing of Lafayette Park and the firing of the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York. My next guest, he joins us to discuss all of that, plus police reform bill that he is co-sponsoring. Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, he's a Democrat from Illinois, and he serves on the Intelligence Committee. You know, Congressman, um, I'd love to start off um, with the Bolton book, and we spoke to Dan Goldman yesterday, who was counsel uh, for your committee in the impeachment hearings. And while Dan said it's great that Bolton validated a lot of what came up during your probe, um, he certainly wasn't going to give Bolton any credit because Bolton said not only is the president unfit for office, but in effect, what he did in Ukraine was only an hors d'oeuvre compared to what he did rampantly, apparently, across the globe. Um, how frustrated are you uh, that Bolton had so much to say but never testified? And is it worth it, given where we are in the political calendar and where the Senate would probably go or not go, to bring him in? Well, I think that he was never going to testify. Um, I think that he wanted to save everything for his book and try to make money. He's not a patriot. Um, he is possibly somebody who is, um, you know, basically saying the truth. Uh, because it is consistent with everything else we learn, but he's not somebody who's looking out for the best interests of the country. He's looking out for his own best interests, and in that in that regard, you know, he joined the right administration uh, because birds of the same feather flock together here. And to that end, I guess a similar line is what's going on at DOJ, and more specifically with our Attorney General. Um, Given what happened with the SDNY, how that was handled, um, also how they got involved, obviously, with Stone and so many other cases, what is your level of more than concern um, with specifically William Barr, but where he might go from here between now and the rest of the uh, political calendar? Because I, I can't see a line that he won't cross. I agree with you. He is... Um somebody who thinks that he's the president's general purpose attorney instead of being the attorney general. He, he doesn't understand that he needs to be acting in the best interest of the United States. And, um, you know, it, obviously we saw what happened with Mr. Berman in New York, but even before that, he helped to orchestrate the tear gassing and the firing of rubber bullets on protesters in Lafayette Square for a photo op for the president. And, I think that this, uh, this person uh, needs to be held to account. Uh, some people think that we should wait until a new president comes into power. I think we should investigate him now and make sure that at the least we uncover exactly what is going on over there for the public to know. Um, and uh, of course, in the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Nadler will have direct jurisdiction. And I think we should also uh, potentially look at appropriations for DOJ and maybe fence in some of those appropriations and programs based on his behavior. And that's maybe a good segue to what you've been working on um, and what's expected to pass the, the House tonight in your policing reform bill. When I look at what the Senate did, the Senate Republicans, am I wrong to say, um, while it's certainly is short of what you've been looking for, it seemed to be a good beginning, good faith effort. Um, this wasn't just, you know, an empty piece of legislation. It, it's the beginnings of real reform. And if we were talking about this six months ago, we would call this seismic in terms of the changing and the oversight. 
while it may not meet the moment, do you think you have a partner in the Senate here to get something meaningful done at the end of the day? Well, I do want to give, give credit to Senator Tim Scott. I do think that he's trying to act in good faith. I do think that he's also hemmed in by his colleagues in terms of what he can and can't do. And quite frankly, what he came up with uh, was rather, um, it was kind of a watered down toothless bill in this sense. It has a lot of good, uh, good sounding themes, but it doesn't end chokeholds. It doesn't do anything about qualified immunity, which amounts to absolute immunity for police officers in their wrong wrongdoing. It doesn't um, end no-knock warrants. And basically, um, it amounts to encouraging jurisdictions to enact reform when the broad majority of American people want uh, these reforms to be mandated, to be done not voluntarily, but uncompulsorily. And this is very important. That being said, um, I am glad that Senator Scott came up with this um, uh, initial uh, idea of reform, uh, and perhaps down the road we can work with him again. But the current Senate proposal on the Republican side, um, it, it, it falls far short of what the American people are demanding. I know there's no way of knowing the answer to this question, but how comfortable are you that we're going to come out as a country um, on the other side of this in a much better place. Uh, you see uh, what's going on, ver largely overwhelmingly peaceful protests calling for meaningful change. You're also seeing some other things going on at the same moment. You're seeing police uh, feeling both under siege and also, you know, some just leaving the force altogether. Uh, what, give a reason why the people at the end of the day should feel that while we're going through an ugly chapter right now, it's a necessary one and we'll be better as a country on the other end. Well, I think the, the reason why I am um, optimistic is that when I spoke at recent protests, um, I saw such a broad swath of people who came and spoke out in favor of equality, against discrimination, against systemic racism, and it, against police brutality. It included um, people of all ethnicities and races. Um, it included people of all age ranges. And it included moms with babies in their strollers. And I'm talking about white as well as other moms. And the reason why I take hope in that is that I do think the American people have moved in a direction that perhaps um, my colleagues and friends on the other side um, have not necessarily kept up with. But um, hopefully, with, a, with the elections coming up in November, uh, this will be an issue that all elected officials will have to answer to. And hopefully, under a new president, we can really make uh, a quantum leap forward in terms of police reform. Congressman, I know you got a busy day. I appreciate you making a few minutes for us. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And up next, we pivot to the race for the White House. Some new polls in the pivotal swing states, they show good news for Joe Biden and bad for the president. After break, I'm going to show you what we mean.